You guys ready? <laughs> Gonna touch on some fun topics there. Politics, hedonism, materialism, individualism, nobody will leave unscathed over the next few weeks. Woo! It's gonna be good, it's gonna be good because we need to learn how to live in the resurrection now, right? We had Easter, we celebrated that, and now we have to learn what it means to live life looking through a Christ-centered lens. What lens are you looking at life through? I've got some lenses here that, uh, that, that change the way that I see the world. Any of you, what do you think? What do you think? Gary, what do you think? Gary, Gary? Yeah, Gary, Gary likes these. I, I kind of figured you might like those. Yeah, I, guess I see some things a little different, right? It's like everything's a little bit blue. Everything's a little more chill. You guys see me a little different, right? If I came wearing these. Lenses change the way we see things. Let's see what else I have here, my, my, my goodies. Yeah, these are my, uh, these are my progressive lenses. Yes. <laughs> I used to call them transition lenses, but they were actually progressive. They're clear up top, reading glasses down here, and I wear these to try to look smart sometimes. Um, <laughs> no, these are <laughs> now these are the ones, right? This is now my how my kids see me at home most of the time, right? This is like the the reading glasses. Those came at, in the '40s. Um, there's these. These are my special. Do you guys remember these? Uh, August 21st, 2017, for my Kosai special solar eclipse glasses. Yeah, I keep these in my office, right? I mean, they allow me to see an eclipse that you normally can't see. So lenses change the way we see things, right? Changes, uh, lenses change our view. And it's the way we go through the world, and you can wear some of these glasses, and things look completely different. Right? Have you ever left your sunglasses on? Like, was, we were out at a track meet the other week with one of our girls and had sunglasses on, and all of a sudden the sun goes down, and after a while you're wondering, like, why is it so dark? Right? And you forget you still have your sunglasses on, right? The way we see lenses changes the way we see things. And, and we're using that term of lenses as a way of talking about the worldviews that we live under. Worldviews that we have. Here's what I de define worldview. It's the lens through which we see reality, make sense of life, and engage the world. Okay, so that's a worldview. It's the way that we see the, the, the world around us. We try to make sense of it. And then because of what we think and see that framework, then we go in and we engage the world. And so we all have a different worldview. We see a different picture of reality. We have a different framework, and it affects the way we live. And that's why different people can see things very different. You name an issue, and can there be more than one way to see something? What's behind that? Is it just an opinion? There's a worldview. There's a framework that's causing us to make the kinds of decisions that we're making. So in a, in a different way, in a simple example, if I had an apple up here, right? If I had an apple up here, a botanist would look at this and go, man, I want to classify that, right? If there was a, a grocer, the grocer would say, you know, I'm going to inventory that and see if I can make some money off that. If it's an artist, they might see the apple and go, I'm going to paint a picture, a still life of this. A photographer will take a picture, perhaps. And if a kid sees it, they'll come up and they'll take a bite out of it, right? It's like my lunch. I'm going to eat this. Different ways we can see the very same thing, but with a different set of lenses, a different eyes on it, things begin to look very different. And so when we think about worldview, and maybe it feels like in school you learned about worldviews, but worldviews really look at a lot of different things in life, but a lot of existential kinds of questions, too. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Is there a creator? What's the purpose in life? What's my goal? How do I make decisions? Why do I, would I act in one way versus another? How do I make my plans for the future? What's most important in life? And so I know many of us, we don't go through life going, I have this one world view and that's how I process everything. We don't even, uh, I think, be, we're not even fully aware of the worldviews that we have. And so there's a lot of worldviews out there. They, a lot of them end in ism. There's a lot of isms out there. And if you Google isms, you're going to find all kinds of isms out there. Humanism, atheism, modernism, postmodernism, Marxism, communism, capitalism, intellectualism, narcissism, relativism, existentialism. And a lot of you guys are like zoning out now. It feels like school, right? You're going to get tested on this. There's, there's dozens more, these isms, and, and they have a philosophy, they have an approach, they have a way of seeing the world and, and acting accordingly to that worldview. Now the reality is, like, again, I think none of us kind of say, I subscribe to this one worldview. For us, mostly, it's kind of like we're going through the golden corral of, of, of isms, right? And we have kind of a smorgasbord plate full of, full of different isms that kind of create the way we approach the world, and we maybe never really step back and say, why am I acting and reacting and processing life in the way that I am? And is it leading me to the hope, to the goals, to the peace, to the fulfillment, to the desired life that I want to experience? 
And so when I think about that in this series, I want to look at four isms. I read an, uh, a daily devotional a few months ago that, from, from Rick Warren, and he mentioned these, and, and it just kind of stuck with me. So I really decided to, I want to dive into this and, and do a series on that because I believe these isms the, or these worldviews that we're going to look at shape American culture more than we realize. They shape us in such a way that it's almost like a part of just, just who we are. It's like, the, it's like a fish swimming in, in the water doesn't even know that it's really in water. But we're surrounded by it. It's always there. And I think even in the church and as followers of Christ, we want to bend the words of Jesus. We want to take the gospel. We want to take Christianity and try to make them fit into these different lenses. And so as you saw in that video, the four lenses we're going to look at, the first one is materialism. We're going to talk about that today. Materialism and the lens we're going to call it is designer frames, right? And then next week, we're going to look at hedonism. Hedonism, but really looking at this idea of pleasure, this longing for comfort, for happiness, for pleasure, and finding that, and, and uh, that's rose-colored glasses. Then the third week, we're going to look at individualism, me, my selfie, and I, right? That's a lens so many of us are seeing the world through a selfie lens. What is individualism? How does that impact us? And then not an ism, politicsism. I'll just make it an ism. We're going to talk about politics, we're going to see red and blue. Yes, we're going to talk about that. How, has that. how does that shape us? We cannot live in this country without these four uh, different lenses shaping us in such a big way. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to see how do these fall short, though, in the end? How does every one of these leave us longing for more, and how can we get refocused and recentered into a Christ-centered, gospel-centered lens that allows us to see the world in a way that our Creator designed for us. And I believe that's where we're going to discover the truth. Now, this problem of uh, being surrounded by a world culture and, and being, uh, you know, indoctrinated, whether we like it or not, it's what we live in, you know, capitalism and all these different things that, that we swim in. How do we t step back and how do we take a look at that? Well, this problem isn't new. It's not just new to us. It's actually as old as the Bible. It's as old as the early church. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, we're going to look uh, at the book of Colossians. And Colossians was, was, a, was a letter that was written by Paul, who had started many churches, um, in, in the, the church in Colossae, and it was also written to a church in Laodicea. Now, we don't have a letter to the church in Laodicea, but this was a letter that was asked to be sent on to them as well. And so he's addressing issues in these churches. And sometimes it doesn't come out right out and say, this is the issue, but by reading it, by looking at the context, we learn this is the, these are the challenges that the church was facing. And so the challenge is that this church uh, views and trying to navigate how do I live as a follower of Christ in this world and some that were, were putting different religious regulations on top of them. Others was pagan religions. Do I worship? Do we worship um, angels? Are there certain religious customs we need to follow? And so into this context, Paul is writing to now help them say, let, let me reshape, in the word, words I'll use, your worldview. How do you refocus in on that? And so Colossians chapter 2, I want to look at the first 10 verses to frame us in before we get into talking about materialism, just as a context of, of lenses and worldviews. So Paul writes, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea. So the church in Col Colossae and in Laodicea. And for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan. Do, do, do. We have confidence in God's mysterious plan. What is this mysterious plan? I want to know this mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. The mysterious plan out there is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Where are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden? In the farthest outreach of space, at the depths of the sea, and, and science, and the technology. Now there's things to unmine, but where is all of it contained? It's in the fullness and the richness of Christ. I'm telling you this, he says, so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I'm far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should, and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now, as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord... You must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught 
and you will overflow with thankfulness, right? So there's this grounding in Christ. If you can, the, all the wisdom and all the knowledge, if you are rooted and grounded in that, you're going to be able to stand strong. And then comes the key verse that I want us to look at even throughout this series. It's verse 8. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So you just read that context. You read that scripture and you put it in the context of today. And you put it in the context of the worldviews that we're being influenced by. And you come back to that key verse. It doesn't feel like we could just plaster that all over, you know, maybe put it on our television, put it on our, put it on our, uh, you know, our laptop, on our phone. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. And so as we're going to look at these different lenses and worldviews, we want to see what is human thinking? Where are we getting off track and how can we see what God's word has to say for us so we can be rooted and grounded in the truth? Let's pray and then we'll jump into the first of these. Heavenly Father, Thank you for these words written in the Bible so long ago that still apply to us today. Father, help us to see what's influencing us, what's maybe leading us astray, what we buy into and maybe aren't even aware of. God, over these next several weeks, give us a lens to see with your eyes, to see through the gospel, to see through your truth, and God, to cause us to live in a different way on your foundation. We open ourselves to hear your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start today looking at materialism, right? So in this context of a Christ-centered uh, lens, a gospel-centered lens, what does, it, uh, what does the Bible say about this? Well, first of all, materialism, we're talking about right, the designer lenses, right? If you look at different lenses, designer lenses kind of capture this idea of materialism. Um, I have these, uh, these glasses, one that, that are somewhat similar to uh, sunglasses I got when I was in, um, when I was in college. My sister was dating, uh, who, who is now my brother-in-law, Ken, and he, he was a lawyer at the time and, and was, was, you know, have, living his, uh, his life and, and whatever and, and being a lawyer. And then he, um, for my birthday, he got me one of the coolest gifts ever. He got me Ray-Ban sunglasses <laughs> as a college student. And they were, they were kind of like this, except they actually said Ray-Ban on them because they were Ray-Bans, not like these that I got from Costco. By the way, you can get these at Costco. They got the little reader part down below, so you can be like driving and reading at the same time. You can get a two-pack. Okay, so these are not designer <laughs> lenses. These are shiny, and then there's some matte ones as well. Um, but, uh, but I remember getting those Ray-Bans, and I had those Ray-Bans on, and I'm like thinking, all of a sudden, like, same guy, same thing, put these glasses on, and all of a sudden, it's like, chest comes up, right? Walking a little prouder, walking, feeling a little cooler, feeling like there's a little bit more, you know, to me. And it's like, how does that happen? They're just blocking sun. But there's something about these designer frames. There's something about that, that, that makes you feel a certain way. And it's part of this culture that we're in. Like, you don't have enough. You need something more. There's something better. There's something more fashionable. You'll be viewed in a different way. And I'm as much swimming in the stream as anyone ever in the culture around us that says, newer, better. I like getting a new gadget, a new gizmo. You know, what's, when my car dies and I'm ready for something else, I like that next thing or that next house or next vacation. Those are things that, that we look forward to, things that we enjoy. But I, I ask when we look at materialism, materialism and the, and the definition of materialism is money matters most, success is measured by wealth. So the materialism lens is it's all about the money. How much of your time in your day in your week do you spend thinking about money? How to get more of it, how to save it, how to invest it, how to make a better purchase, how to save some money, what to do with it, how long it's going to last, how you can get a raise, how your investments are doing, right? Money is so much a part of our lives. What can we buy with it? What kind of lifestyle can we live from that? It's so much ingrained to us. As a matter of fact, we have this wonderful phrase that captures materialism at its core, and we call it the American dream, right? I mean, it's really at the heart of the American dream. The heart of the American dream isn't just that I can be, be happy and, and live with my family. Whenever someone talks about you can live the American dream, you know who's usually saying it? Somebody who's successful, right? Somebody who has said, I started out with nothing, right? It's the common story. We start out with nothing, which that means I didn't have any, I didn't have stuff, I didn't have money, I didn't have things, and I lived the American dream, which allows me to get stuff, 
to make money, to be successful, to do that. And I'm not saying that there's something wrong with that kind of thing that you can grow and do better and invest yourself, but it's inherent in us that this is so much a part of our culture that we don't even step back and say, at what point does this become unhealthy? At what point is this our obsession? It's the American dream to go after and pursue it, and so our lives get focused on money and acquisition and things and stuff, and so we swim in that sea. But we get to a point in life where it's not only just our basic needs being met anymore, it goes beyond that, and we start seeing, what brand is on it, right? Are those Ray-Bans? Ooh, those must be better sunglasses. They must block out sunlight better than other glasses. What is it? Why, Why is a plain sweatshirt, you look at it one way, but it has a little swoosh on it, or it says North Face or something, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, that's cooler, right? You can get a handbag at Target, or it says Michael Kors on it. And it's like, ooh, and I'm not dogging anybody for certain brands or whatever, right? But there's just something about these different things. You can wear, you know, yoga pants, but these are Lululemons. <laughs> Woo! Man, those work so different. It's amazing. You walk different in Lululemons than you do in other ones, right? Somebody's got a Ford or they've got, you name the brand, right? You go, what, what is it? And you feel different. You make people look at it different. It's part of this, this, this culture that we live in. And, and, and you turn on the news. You watch, what is the top news? It's all about the economy, right? Economy, inflation, stagflation, you know, microchip shortage, uh, supply chain issues. What is the, invest, the return on investment? What are we doing with our natural resources? The war, yeah, that's bad, but how is it affecting our economy? Right? How quickly it comes back to that, right? COVID is bad, but what's it doing to our economy? Economy, economy, it, right? And we understand that a country needs an economy. We want to be successful. We want to be able to live a good life. But again, the this, this sea that we swim in, how do we, how do we separate ourselves from that and see it through a Christ-centered lens? Because our, our world and those powers that be and those that are in, you know, in the economy that are trying to get us to be consumers, they understand how to get at us, right? 24-7 accessibility to us, right? Amazon Prime. Oh, changed lives, hasn't it? Next day. You want something? You get it the next day. When we lived in Scottsdale, I don't know if we have it here in, in Columbus, Amazon Prime did two-hour delivery for a lot of items. They just two It's going to pop up at your door right there, right? Grubhub, Uber Eats. I mean, just instant satisfaction. We see over 5,000 ads a day on average. And if you step back and you go, come on, that can't be. But just start thinking about the ways in which we see little product placements and, and all kinds of things. We're constantly being marketed to and inundated with this information. Some things that I, that I learned when reading, reading a, a book recently um, that uh, talks about just life and consumerism. I'll talk a little bit more later about it. But it talked about this, you know, like those uh, free food samples at, um, you know, you get Costco typically and places like that. Who likes free food samples? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was the worst part about COVID was, what? <laughs> no free food samples, that's why I go here. Um, and, you know, I find it as a victory when I can sample something and don't buy it, right? Like, ha I got you, I got a free food and you didn't get any of my money, right? So I thought that was like, you know, they're losing on me. And then I come to realize, you know why they do free, free food samples? I mean, I'm sure they want you to buy that product, but you know what it is? When you start eating, it triggers your hunger response. And lo and behold, what's all around you? Food, right? So they, they, hook, line, and sinker, right? They get us, right? We're, we're, we're buying more, more stuff. Have you ever heard of, a, what's it called, a, a loss leader? A loss leader is, a, is an item, is a product that is discounted below, you know, its, its, its retail price or well below even the cost. And it gets you in the store or it gets you to the website because they know once you buy something, you're more likely to buy something else. You ever wonder why malls are so confusing if anyone else still goes to a mall? <laughs> They're designed to keep you in the mall to keep shopping, to not find your way out. Now this is a new one for me is, what's that? This was a new one to me. I always wondered, maybe you're like me, you wondered why are outlet malls always so far outside of the city? I'm always thinking like, it doesn't make sense. Like I would go there maybe more if it was closer. Why, Why do they pick these spots so far out of cities everywhere for the outlet malls, strategically? Because you're gonna make a trip out of it. And when you go, you're gonna go, I'm not just going for one thing, we're here now, we're gonna go and Walk all the stores, right? We're going to make that lap and see. Designed for us to consume, right? So, I mean, this is, again, this is the sea. This is what we swim in. And so we have to step back and go, how do I view this differently? And what's going on? Why is this insatiable hunger in me there to to consume, to have more, to feed that in me? I think we live under the weight of an entire closet full of nothing to wear. (laughs) Right? 
That's how we know we live in a materialistic culture. Nothing to wear. Tons of clothes there, right? I'll put it this way. Our closets, basements, garages, and storage units are full, but our souls are empty. That's the problem with materialism. We fill up, we fill up, we consume more and more and more, and we think we're getting somewhere. In the end, it leaves us empty. We need to escape this sea, swimming in the sea of consumerism. And it can feel impossible to escape or even imagine an alternative. But that's what we're going to look at today. In the next chapter in Colossians, chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, Don't be greedy for the good things of this life, for that is idolatry. Something shifts over into greed. Greed when we must have. Now, here's the thing, and I don't know anybody who walks around and goes, I'm greedy, I'm greedy. We don't see greed in the mirror. We don't understand, but there's a part of this, that, that longing, that desire to have, to consume, to want. And he ultimately says, that becomes idolatry. It becomes the focus. It becomes an idol. We begin to worship at, at, this, at this God of consumerism, right, of, of more and of acquiring. And so he's saying, don't let that become the point. Now, Jesus tells a story that we want to look at here in Luke chapter 12, and, and it actually begins with the context at verse 13. And so Jesus' approach that someone called from the crowd, it says in verse 12, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, in that, in that time, the estate was always given to the oldest brother. If the parent passed away, the oldest son would get it. So the idea of dividing the estate was not something that, that happened. And so, obviously, this younger brother's like, it's not fair. My brother's getting all this stuff. I just want some things. I want to get mine. I want to have a portion of that. So he's asked him, tell my brother to divide it. Jesus replied, friend. Who made me a judge over you to decide such things as this, then he, as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, I like that he calls himself his friend, right? My friend, maybe he's lonely. You have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now we stop, there we go. This is the, this is the Middle Eastern dream right here, right? This is the American dream right here in the scripture. Like this is guy's doing it. I mean, this is what we, what we go after. I mean, he's planting crops. He's working hard. He's making his way up. He's He's getting a harvest, he's building barns, they're too small, there's more. It's awesome. He gets to a point in life where he can buy the Winnebago, where he can you know, roam the country, where he can retire to Florida or Arizona or with family. He can travel the world, eat, drink, and be merry. It's in the Bible. This is awesome. Jesus, you got it. The next verse. Dun, dun, dun. But God said to him. Now we see from a different perspective, right? A different lens, God's lens. You fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, Jesus said, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. I want to look at three things that Jesus said here that help us with this Christ-centered lens to see it a little differently. The first thing he said before he told the story when he was talking to the brother, he said, guard against every kind of greed. Guard against every kind of greed. Guard against it. Be, be careful with it. That hunger, that thing inside of you that is wanting more and desiring for more, that drives us to accumulate. What is it that's in there? What is it that you're looking for? Is it security? If I just had this, then I can have it. Is it comfort? What is it that's what driving you? Is it acceptance? If I look a certain way, have a certain thing, live in a certain neighborhood, is that what's going to happen? See, in our culture... This is so much a part of how we, how we medicate ourselves, we actually call it retail therapy. Right? You've heard that phrase, retail therapy? It's more as a joke, right? But the idea is just that when we feel down, when we're bad, just go to Amazon Prime, get something to mail, and that little dopamine hit you get when the, your package is on the front step. Woo! Open that up, something new. It feels good. Life is better when you get a package, when you buy something, right? And, and, and there's a hunger there. It's talking about something inside of us and we're settling for a Twinkie instead of something more that's going to satisfy us. And so we have to look at that. That accumulation right, will never lead you there. It'll just be temporary feelings. You can't save or shop your way to peace and fulfillment. 
So, we need a cure to greed. The cure to greed is contentment, gratitude, and generosity. Contentment, gratitude, and generosity. Those two things don't seem to be compatible with mater- these three things with, com- with materialism, right? You don't think of somebody who's materialistic as someone who's content, who's grateful, right? Who can, who can just be generous. Hebrews 13.5 says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. The interesting connection, right? Don't love money because what do we have instead? Jesus, I will never leave you. I will, I will be with you. I will not abandon you. So I want you to practice these phrases with me as we practice some contentment and gratitude, okay? So say these with me as we see them here on the screen together. Okay, the first one, say it with me. I don't need anything, I'm good. Some of you, that's all you need to take, walk away with with the sermon today, right? You just walk away with this phrase, I, I don't need anything, I'm good. Now my kids hate this when it comes to Christmas and my birthday because I, you know, when I say like, I don't need anything, I'm good, it's like, but dad, we have to buy you something, right? Oh, I, I don't need anything, I'm good. That's a wonderful phrase. All right, this next phrase. I'm happy with what I have. Just walk around your house and you go, I'm happy with what I have. Isn't that awesome to be able to say that? So easy, right? Let's do another one here. It's not the newest or best, but it does the job. It's the American way, right? Let's do one more. I have more than enough. It's a different worldview. Because the world is telling us you never have enough. You always need more. It doesn't do the job. That's why you've got to replace it. You, you'd be much happier if, right? So we just have to see, and like the fish having to get out of the water and go, is this what I'm swimming in? We have to see the environment that we swim in. Jesus says, guard against every kind of greed. And then he says the next thing here, life is not measured by how much you own. Well, when it comes to money, we measure all kinds of stuff. That's what we love about this kind of economy. We measure bank accounts. We measure salaries. We measure investment returns, right? We measure gains. We measure uh, square footage on the house. We measure horsepower on cars. Like, we measure this stuff. And the more, the bigger, the better, right? That's why we measure. Here's the problem. First, we own our possessions. Then our possessions own us, right? We think we own. We're in charge. We have that. And pretty soon, you'll turn around, and now it's like you feel burdened. You have all this stuff, and you wonder, where did it come from? I'm possessing so many things. You ever walk around your house or your things, and you go, ah, oh, so much stuff. We bring so much stuff into our house, stuff that was good once, and now it's old, and yet we hold on to it. We need liberation from these things, right? This from this need to possess. I read this great book by Joshua Becker called The, the More of Less. The More of Less. I highly recommend it. may even do a series on this at some point, talking about how to create margin and space and, and, and to simplify life in different ways. Here's what he says. Find the life you want under the stuff you don't need. See, what he's saying is, isn't just to get rid of stuff and have less just in order to have more space and have it be a little nicer and be a little freer. He's saying the life you actually want to live, the things that, that are keep, the stuff is keeping you from that, that life. You're bound down by it. You're, you're overwhelmed with it, right? Less is more. We've used that phrase, right? You've heard that phrase? After reading this book, I was so ready to get working on uh, in places in our house. I mean, I was hauling out garbage bags of stuff. Throw it out, get rid of it, sell it, donate it, give it away. It's amazing how good that feels. There was stuff I was looking at. You know what? Like, I brought this from my house growing up to Indiana, and then from Indiana, two moves, and then we moved it from there to Arizona and to two different houses in Arizona. I've moved it back here to, to Columbus, and I'm looking at it like, and I don't even use it. It just sits there. Get rid of it. <laughs> right? And you just kind of go like, why am I so weighed down with these things? And, and, but I realized then there's certain things, like I, that, that attachment, I can't. That shirt that I haven't worn in four years, you never know, I, I, I might need it one day. <laughs> right? And, and, and we realize how attached we are to that. I realize how attached I am to things, but, but right, it's not measured by how much you own. Get rid of things, own less, and see what happens. When Jesus sent out his disciples, he told them, don't take anything with you. I wonder why. Because you're freer. You're freer to serve God. You're freer to focus on people. Because when we have a lot of stuff, we have to start taking care of stuff. We have to organize it and reorganize it and remove it. Then it gets dirty and messy. We have, then we buy more organizing shelves. And we buy every, a storage unit. We just have to, we keep reorganizing the junk, but it's not freeing us from it, right? So get rid of it. 
simplified. Jesus says, don't be measured by how much you own. So what we should be measured by? Maybe measured by how much you give away. Maybe measured by how little you need, how much you can be content with. How much do you invest in the kingdom of God? Third thing, Jesus says, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Now, he's not necessarily saying here, you can't have earthly wealth. Earthly wealth and people of means have done some amazing things and do amazing things in this world, in our church, in our community, when their heart is in the right place, when they have a rich relationship with God. It's amazing that you can build spaceships to reach outer space, you can build the largest companies, you can have the most success, and yet be considered wise by the world and amazing, and God would simply look back and go, you fool. You don't have a rich relationship with God. The one thing that, that you can be rich in, the one thing you can't buy, you don't have. And I'm willing to give it to you. Have a rich relationship with God. Where is that hunger, that desire? What's it for? What are you rich in? It can only be found in Christ. That peace, that fulfillment, that satisfaction of, of what we're looking for. And again, we just we fill ourselves with, with junk food and purchasing and things that give us a good feeling for a while that brand new vehicle, and then later on that car payment doesn't feel so good, does it? <laughs> Those things don't satisfy. Let me ask you this. Are you satisfying your hunger with things that pass or that which lasts? Because at the bottom of this is a hunger. There's something in our worldview that says, like, if I have more, if I accumulate, if I get these things, have more zeros, if I can get to this place, then I'll be satisfied. That's a hunger. Are you satisfied in things that pass or the things that last? The things that last, you know what? They're not things, right? It's people, it's relationships, but it's a relationship with Christ that ultimately is going to give us that satisfaction. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6 on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. It's where are you putting that hunger? Where is that hunger and thirst? Is it more for the next accumulation, the next paycheck, the next investment, the next return? Where is that hunger? So when you take off these designer frames, look through the lens of materialism and just ask ourselves these questions. Is my money and stuff bringing me greater fulfillment and peace or not? Is my money and stuff leading me closer or farther from God? Because I think that's, we have to look at that lens and ask ourselves that question and put on a new lens. Again, money, stuff, things aren't bad. I'm not here to dog those things. It's a perspective. It's about having your relationship with God in the right place, seeing your things through a way that God can use that in a way for the kingdom and for others. Some of these are blessings and gifts that to enjoy. We say, thank you, God, gratitude. But let me give you three simple action steps, or not so simple, but maybe you pick one of these as your next step. Practice contentment and gratitude. Right, you want to break greed? Practice contentment and gratitude, and I really should have added generosity on that, like I said earlier. Just give or walk around your house and use one of those phrases this week. Pick one phrase and say it over and over every day. I'm good. I've got everything I need. I have more than enough. I'm happy with what I got. It does the job. And see what happens there. Second, simplify. Free yourself from your things. Maybe some of you need to go on like a tear in your house and just, and you'll feel some freedom this week, getting rid of all that stuff. Three, pursue a rich relationship with God, the most important because that's where life is found. So I think as we look at and, and we live and we swim in this culture, how can we, as followers of Christ, as those on the journey, as those seeking to follow Christ, show something different to the world? When everyone around is consumerism, the next thing, the next, why do you have this peace? Why do you not seem to care about some of your stuff, things so much? I remember back when, when I was, I think I was, I was 18, and we were in uh, Germany, and uh, my, my brother-in-law, oh, not my brother-in-law, my, um, my, my cousin had a Porsche 911. It was new at the time. It was awesome. We were at a family reunion, and it was like, you know, sometimes people with really nice cars, it's like, don't you look, don't touch, I'll take you for a ride. You know what he did? He said, here, guys, to the cousins, there were a bunch of us cousins, he's like, here you go, have fun. That's a, good, that's a good cousin, isn't it? <laughs> I'm 18 years old in Germany on the Autobahn. A little crazy, right? 
We ran, and then we drove it crazy till we were out of gas. We came back and said, it's out of gas. And he gave us money and said, here, fill it up. And, you know, he, he was blessed with, with means. But you know what he said? He, he said, God provided for me. It's just metal. It's just rubber and, and plastic and whatnot. It's fun. Enjoy it. Have fun. It didn't have a hold on him. I think that's a beautiful place to be when even if you have means that the stuff doesn't have a hold on you. And so we want to live in a way that says, I've got something more. I found something deeper. I found it in Christ. And so we want to walk away from here not just looking at our stuff differently, but really pursuing a rich relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, man, we are so, so much enveloped in this the stream of materialism and consumerism and capitalism. and Lord, there's, there's something great about the gifting you've given us, the ability to bring value to this world, to have influence, to grow in responsibility, to earn money, to make money, to even gain wealth. And Lord, we see your gift in your hand in that. But Father, help us not to lose our perspective. Help us not just to see through a certain lens, but that that sees this stuff for us and for our peace and fulfillment. But God, that we need to find that in you. Help us this week, God, to, to, to loosen our grip on things, on stuff, on zeros at the end of bank accounts or paychecks. And Father, help us to leverage what you've given us for the kingdom and to have a relationship with you. May we stand out in a different way because we understand what it means to be centered in you, to find our hope and fulfillment in you. We love you, Lord, and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.